Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to have an introduction to polynomials. By this point, you've seen polynomials, even if you don't remember the name, countless times in previous courses. As a brief reminder, they're the guys who look like x squared minus 2x plus 9, or maybe 3x to the fifth minus 8x cubed plus 10x squared plus x plus 47. This stuff looks familiar, right? Now, you might wonder why you've spent so much time on them before and why we're studying them yet again in another course. In short, it's because polynomials are ridiculously, absurdly useful. They come up in every branch of science, from physics to medicine to economics. They're going to be important if you're going to do engineering work. They're going to be important if you're going to do computer programming work. They're going to be important for pretty much anything you want to do. If you want to study higher level mathematics, they're going to be important in that too. Polynomials are crazy important. They're going to be important in any branch of science and in anything that's in higher, deeper levels of mathematics. So that's why they keep drilling them for all these years is because you really have to understand polynomials for a huge number of things, so it's really important to get a good grasp on it now. A polynomial. What is a polynomial? Formally, we define it as an expression of the form an times x to the n plus an minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a2 times x squared plus a1 times x plus a0. And now don't worry, what we call, we just call these little things down here, these are the subscripts, which just means to say that it's there's a, but then there's many different a's. There's a n, a n minus 1, a n minus 2, so on and so on, a 2, a 1, a 0, just many different a's. So what this expression means, we've got n is a non-negative integer, and all of our a's, the a n, a, min, a n minus 1, so on, up until a 0, are all real numbers, which is to say that they're just constants. And finally, a n itself, the first one, the one at the very front, is not equal to 0. Now, that might seem a little complex in its formal definition, but don't worry. We're about to explain what's going on so we can really understand what a polynomial is. So our expression, once again, was a n times x n plus a n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1, and so on and so on, a 1 times x plus a 0. First thing that we want to get to is we want to start off with this non-negative integer n. This n is really important. That it can be any number, something like 1 or 5 or 968. It's just the exponent that the very first x has. So we could have x to the 1, which we'd normally write as just x, and then other stuff after it. Or we could have x to the 5 and then other stuff after it. Or we could have x to the 968 and then other stuff after it. The n is basically our starting point. What is our starting exponent going to be? Then we've got this structure, blank x to the n plus blank x to the n minus 1 plus blank x to the n minus 2, so on and so on, until finally we get blank x squared plus blank x plus blank, right? If we took x to the fifth, then we'd have blank x to the fifth plus blank x to the fourth plus blank x cubed plus blank x squared plus blank x plus blank. Right, we just fill in those blanks with numbers. That's what all of these a's represent. There are, these are our blanks down below. They're the things that we're filling in. The a's represent those blanks. They're just a number that's going to get stuffed into that place. And finally, the a's blank spaces above can be potentially zero. So if we had a zero here, we'd just knock out the whole thing and we'd pretend it wasn't there. We'd read it as x to the n plus and then x to the n minus 2 would be next, right? If we have blank x squared plus blank x plus blank and we've got 5x squared plus 0x plus 3, we'd probably just read this as 5x squared plus 3. So if we have an a as a zero, it can cause that spot to just disappear. Now, the only spot that's not allowed to disappear is a n. a n, the first spot, this one up here, is not allowed to be 0. Not allowed to be 0. Why not? Because if it was 0, then our x n would just disappear, right? If we were able to have 0, then it would poof, it would be gone. And so if it's gone, that our x n would disappear, at which point, why did we choose n in the first place if we're not even going to have x n show up to the party, right? So since we want to use n, that's why we chose n, we can't have our very first spot disappear and get rid of that n. And that's it. That's a polynomial. Blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the other exponent plus blank, so on and so forth. That's pretty much just the structure of a polynomial. If you can remember that, that's the important part. 
While a polynomial is technically just an expression, like for example, x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 9x plus 17, a polynomial is just this expression this expression of blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the exponent. That's all it is, is just that structure of blank x to the exponent. We normally use them to make functions or equations. So a polynomial function is just a function that's been made out of a polynomial. So a polynomial function is a function that is equal to some polynomial. And a polynomial equation is just an equation made out of it as well. So we could have y equals polynomial, or we could have function equals polynomial. That's it. Also, while we'll generally use x as the variable in polynomials, we should note that any variable can be used. So any variable can be used. The important thing is we're just following this blank something to the exponent structure. Like in our work with functions, we normally use f of x, but there's no reason that we have to use x. x is a commonly used variable, but it's not the only one out there. There's others out there. So all of the below are just as valid as x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 9x plus 17. We could have z to the fourth plus 3z squared minus 9z plus 17, representing the same thing, but instead now we've got a different variable being the placeholder. Or we could have l to the fourth and more things, or theta to the fourth, right? Any symbol can use can be our placeholder. We just want something that's being that placeholder and being raised to an exponent. The degree of the polynomial is the value of n in this expression. So it's whatever our highest exponent is at the front. Informally, we just want to see it as the degree of the largest exponent. The degree is just the largest exponent on a variable. So that's what we want to think of degree is as the largest exponent on one of our variables. If the polynomial isn't in order of largest to smallest exponents, so normally we're in order, right? We go n, and then next we're at n minus 1, and then next we'd be at x to the n minus 2, and so on and so on and so on, until eventually we get to x squared, and then x to the 1, and then Although we might not have, you might not remember this from exponent work before, x to the 0, which we'll talk about in exponents later on. But the point is we keep lowering the exponent, right? We keep going and going and going until we're finally at a constant. But if our polynomial isn't in order of largest to smallest exponents, the degree might not necessarily be the very first one of that you see. It might not necessarily be the one at the very beginning. It could be somewhere in the middle if we aren't necessarily in that order of largest to smallest exponents. The important thing is just to find the largest exponent on a variable and that's your degree. For, let's see some examples. So we could have a polynomial x squared plus 2x plus 1. We look at this one and we go, ah, the largest exponent on anything is that 2, so we get a degree of 2. We look at this one, 5x plus 3, and the biggest one here is just this x. What's its exponent? The exponent of anything is just to the 1 if it doesn't have something already, so we get 1. We look at the next one, 7x cubed minus 4x to the 47 plus 8. The one at the front is x cubed, but it isn't going to be our degree. The degree winds up being that this one isn't in our usual order. It isn't in that general form of x to the n, and then x to the n minus 1, and then x to the n minus 2. This one is out of order, but that doesn't mean that we can't find its degree. We just look through, we look at all of our x's, and we wind up seeing, oh, 47 is the largest exponent on any of our variables, and so it's 47 as our degree. Finally, the last one might be a little bit confusing as well. We see this one and we go, ah, x cubed. Oh, wait, hey, there's an even larger exponent here, right? We have x to the, we have 3 to the fifth, but 3 is not an x, is not an x. It's not a variable. So since it's not a variable, it's out of the running, which leaves us with x cubed as what we've got. And so the degree of that is 3. So you're looking for a variable, a make sure it's a variable with the highest exponent, the largest exponent, and that's your degree for a polynomial. Since a lot of different polynomials come up very often, we've got some special names for them. Some types of polynomials get special names, and so we want to know them. They're not super important to remember these, although quadratic will come up so often it's definitely going to be burned into your memory. Um, it's not super important to absolutely remember these, but they will come up, and so you want to know them because you might have to know these vocabulary words. You can figure out what name to use based on the degree of the polynomial for these ones. A cubic is a degree 3 polynomial. So this one has a degree of 3 here, or 5x cubed minus 3x squared plus 27, once again, degree of 3. A quadratic has a degree of 2, so x squared plus x plus 1, or negative 17, x squared plus 20x minus root 2. A linear has a degree of 1, so x to the 1, pi times x to the 1, 
And then finally, a constant is just a degree zero polynomial, which is to say it has no variables in it at all. So one has no variables. 5,111,723 still has no variable, right? There's no x here. So since there's no x, we've got degree zero. We can also talk about a polynomial based on the number of terms that make it up. Once again, not super important to have this really memorized, but you want to be familiar and aware of these vocabulary terms because they will show up now and then. Trinomial is something that has three terms. We can remember this from trinomial like a tricycle or a triangle, all things having to do with the number three. x squared plus x plus one. The squared isn't so much the important part as the x squared. We've got three things, 47x to the ninth plus x cubed plus two. The degree no longer matters. It's not about the degree, so I really should not have accidentally circled that two, uh, x squared. It's just the number of things we have, 47x to the ninth plus x cubed plus two. A binomial is something that has two terms, so x and then 1, or negative 52x to the 7th and 892x. It doesn't matter that it's a coefficient times an x. That's OK. It's allowed to be coefficient times some variable raised to some exponent, but that's the whole thing. That is one of our terms for this. So binomial, two terms, could be x plus 1, simple as that, or it could be more complex like negative 52x to the 7th plus 892x. Or we could have one term which is x, or maybe even something really, really large like x raised to the 1,845. All right. Distributive property. Very often, we're going to need to either factor polynomials, break them into their multiplicative pieces, or expand these factors in a poly into a polynomial that's in general form. So take these multiplicative pieces and then combine them together to get something larger that gives us the whole polynomial in that general form that we saw of blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the exponent. We'll see why this matters later on, especially in our next one where we'll talk about, next lesson where we'll talk about roots and zeros of polynomial. But for now, it's really important to understand understand how we get somewhere from x plus 1 times x plus 2 into x squared plus 3x plus 2. This is probably going to be a bit of a review for most of you, but it's good to understand why this is happening as opposed to just being able to do it mechanically. So let's look at what's making it up. The thing this comes from is the distributive property, which says how multiplication, multiplication interacts with parentheses. If something multiplies against parentheses, it distributes to every term that's separated by addition or separated by subtraction. For example, if we have a times b plus c, then the a gets distributed onto the b and the a gets distributed onto the c. So we get ab plus ac. So that's how distribution works. How's that connect to foiling things? How's it connect to different multiplicative factors for polynomials? Well, our distributive property, a times b plus c, becomes ab plus ac. From this property, we can use that on two different things in parentheses. We can distribute parentheses onto other parentheses. In the most basic form of two binomials, which is to say two things with two terms, we have the FOIL method. So for example, if we have a plus b times x plus y, we can think of a plus b as just being a block. So like a is a block in our top example up here, a is a block up here, we can think of a plus b as being a block down here. So a plus b goes on to x, and a plus b goes on to y. So we get a plus b times x and a plus b times y. Then we turn right around and we distribute the other direction. We take x and we distribute that onto the a and onto the b, and we take y and we distribute that onto the a and distribute that onto b, and so we get ax plus bx and then ay plus by. Now what does FOIL mean? FOIL is a mnemonic to help us remember the order of multiplication. Firsts, outers, inners, lasts. Let's see how that comes to be. That in the, would be this way, where it's a plus b times x plus y. We would do the firsts. Firsts, we would do a and x. Those are the first things, so we'd get a, x. And then next we'd do the outers. a is on the outside, and y is on the outside, right, the outer part of our parentheses. So we get a times y plus a times y. b times x would be our inners, the things on the inner part of the parentheses, b times x. And then b times y would be our lasts because the last thing in each of our parentheses, plus b times y. And we see that these two things are exactly the same thing. It's just reordered. So 
the distributive property, FOIL, same thing going on here. It's just a way of being able to say, how is this going to multiply? How is it going to distribute onto the other thing? The way that we're making this FOIL method is two distributions, one after another. But when we're actually using the distributive property to multiply out polynomial factors, we probably want to think in terms of this you know, first term times the other terms inside, and then the second term times the other terms inside the other, and then the third term, and so on and so forth and so on. This idea can expand into working on much longer parentheses than just two uh, terms inside of it. So instead of just using binomials, we could have something like x squared plus 2x plus 2 times 3x squared minus x. So now our first one has three terms as opposed to just two. But the same method still works. So we can have x squared times 3x squared and then x squared times negative x. So x squared times 3x squared plus x squared times negative x. Next up. We'll do 2x times 3x squared and then 2x times negative x. So 2x times 3x squared plus 2x times negative x. And then finally, we'll do 2 times 3x squared and 2 times negative x. 2 times 3x squared, 2 times negative x. Each term in the parenthetical group multiplies all the terms in the other parenthetical group, right? We've got x squared. We've got x squared multiplying against 3x squared and then multiplying against negative x. So each term in the parenthetical group, one of the things in our parentheses, multiplies all the terms in the other parenthetical group. We start with factors and we multiply them out. When we do that, it's called expanding. So what we just saw here is called expanding. When expanding, we're normally expected to simplify. I didn't simplify this one because, you know, we don't really want to get into having to do that right now, but we could simplify it pretty easily at this point, right? We'd multiply things out. We'd get x squared times 3x squared becomes 3x to the fourth, and then we do that with all the other ones, then eventually we could add like terms together, and we could simplify this into one of our general form polynomials of blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the exponent plus blank x to the exponent. We can get back into that general form. Expanding is also sometimes called foiling. Now, this is technically incorrect for larger factors, because remember, foil is based off of that mnemonic, firsts, outers, inners, lasts. So that requires it to be two and two, two binomials put together. But when people say this, we still know what they mean, right? Foiling just means also, it's another way of saying expanding. So when somebody says foil these polynomials or expand these polynomials, they're really getting across the same idea. Use the distributive property, simplify it. The reverse process, taking a polynomial and breaking it up into those multiple, multiplicative factors, is called factoring. So when we have this large general form polynomial and we break it into those pieces, like quantity x squared plus 2x plus 2, and then quantity 3x squared minus x, that's breaking it into the multiplicative factors, so we call it factoring. The long-term behavior of a polynomial is determined by the term that has the largest exponent. Other terms can have an effect, but their effect will become less and less noticeable as x approaches either positive or negative infinity. Basically, as x goes very far in either direction, either to the right or to the left, it's going to wind up being the case that the polynomial will be controlled by whichever exponent is largest, the term that has the largest exponent. Why is this the case? Well, let's consider if we have x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and x to the fifth, and we plug in different values for x, well, when we plug in 1, <clears throat> they wind up pretty much all being the same, right? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, they're all exactly the same. We get nothing but the same thing out of each of them. But if we plug in something different, like 2, we start to see differences crop up. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Of course, the differences aren't very large yet, but as the numbers get larger and larger that we're plugging in, 5, 25, 625, sorry, 5, 25, 125, 625, 3,125, right? The difference between x squared and x to the fifth is now 3,100. And if we just get up to x to the tenth, sorry, x as 10, plug in 10 for x, we get 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, massive differences between x to the fifth and x squared or x to the fifth and x. Even the difference between x to the fourth and x to the fifth, that's a difference of 90,000, right? And we're only at x equals 10. Clearly, x to the fifth, if we place all these guys side by side, x to the fifth is going to be the massive winner. It's going to have huge amounts of control. It's going to contribute so much more to what the value will wind up being than either x, x squared, x cubed, or x to the fourth. None of those are going to be nearly as important as x to the fifth. So as x becomes very big, positive or negative, the polynomial will be controlled by whichever term has the largest 
exponent. The term that has the largest exponent, so in this case, when we compared these five, it would be x to the fifth. Whatever has the largest exponent is going to wind up taking over. Even if it has a really, really tiny coefficient in front, like 0 0.0001 times x to the fifth, that will eventually get cracked, right? As x to the fifth becomes larger and larger and larger, as we plug in fairly large x, like say 10,000, it will be able to knock out that coefficient and still be more important than x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared, x. So the only thing that really matters is which one has the largest exponent. Once you can figure out that, you know which one's going to be in control control of the function at the extreme values of plus or minus infinity. One other thing can have an effect though. So the leading coefficient is very important because it's going to be able to flip it. So the largest exponent is the term that determines things. The term with the largest exponent determines what will happen. But the coefficient on that term will also matter. If the coefficient is positive, it behaves normally. But if the coefficient is negative, it's going to flip the term. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at x squared. x squared has a normal you know, parabola arc like that. But if we have negative x squared, it's going to flip it, right? So with x squared, we wind up going up on the left and up on the right. But with negative x squared, we wind up going down on the right, down on the left, right? So it's going to be down on both sides because the negative is flipping it. So this leading term, whether it's plus or a minus in front is going to have control over what happens. Either we're doing things the normal way, or we're going to flip to the opposite of that. So when a polynomial is in standard form, which is to say the largest exponent is in the front, we call this the leading coefficient test. By knowing what the leading coefficient is and the degree of the polynomial, we'll be able to know what the long-term behavior is. So all you need to know to use the leading coefficient test is the degree of the polynomial and the sign of the leading coefficient, which is going to be either plus or minus, or negative, technically. We know what its long-term behavior will be like. We'll see some pictures on the next one. Long-term behavior, and what do we mean by long-term behavior? That's what happens as x gets very big, as x goes out to plus or minus infinity, right? As it gets very, very far away. We haven't really determined what it means by very, very far away, but just eventually, in the long run, how things will behave. Let's look at some pictures to understand what this means. So for the leading coefficient test, if we've got an even degree, which is a polynomial where the leading coefficient, the leading exponent is going to be even, like x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, et cetera, then if the coefficient is positive, then on the right and on the left, we're going to be going up. Because when we plug in a very large positive number, it's going to still stay a very large positive number. If we plug in a very large negative number, then that even exponent will flip it to being positive, so we'll still be going up. On the other hand, if we have a coefficient that is negative, then when we plug in a very large one, we'll get a very large number out, but it will then get flipped to going negative. If we plug in a very large negative number, then it will get flipped to positive, but once again, the negative coefficient will hit it, and so it will go down. So for an even degree with a positive coefficient, both the left and the right side go up. If we're an even degree with a negative coefficient, both the right and the left side go down. An odd one, though, that is to say something like x to the 1, x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the seventh, so on and so on. An odd degree, if the coefficient is positive, then as we go very far to the right, we're going to go up, right? We plug in a very large number and we'll get a very large positive number out of it. But if we plug in a very large negative number, it has a negative, sorry, it has a odd exponent. So x cubed, right? Negative two plugged into x cubed is negative two times negative two times negative two. Three negative signs means we're left with a negative sign, so we'd get negative eight. So it starts to go down as it goes negative and negative. On the other hand, if we had a negative coefficient, then we would wind up flipping that. As we plug in very large positive numbers, they'll get flipped down to going in the negative way. And if we plug in a very large negative number, it will come out negative, but then it will get flipped by that coefficient and it will go positive, it will go up. Great, so leading coefficient test, if we know it is an even and a positive, it's going to be up on both sides. If it's an even and it's a negative in front, then it's going to be down on both sides. Odd and positive is going to be down on the left, up on the right, and odd with a negative is going to be down on the right, up on the left. So just keep those pictures in mind and think of flipping. Now, notice that in the middle we've got these dashed lines, right? We've got these dashed lines. And what those dashed lines are to say, we don't have any idea what the middle part's going to look like. The leading coefficient test only tells us what happens 
on the extremes, on the far left, the far right, what's going to happen eventually one day in the long term. But what happens in the middle, that's going to depend on the specific thing, right? It could be very interesting. It could be not that interesting. We don't know what it's going to be until we get a specific function that we're looking at. Then we can figure out what it's going to be exactly. The leading coefficient just tells us what's going to happen. Leading coefficient test just tells us what's going to happen in the long term to the very far right, the very far left, those portions. All right, ready for some examples. What is n, the degree, for 2 to the 2 times x to the 4th minus 8 times x cubed plus 2 to the 5th times x minus 19? So remember, the degree is the exponent largest exponent on a variable. So we go through, we look at all of our variables, and we see, hey, this is the largest exponent on any of our variables, right? We might notice this 2 to the fifth, but then we remember, oh yeah, it has to be a variable, so the 2 to the fifth, that isn't in the running, and so x to the fourth is the case. n is just our degree for a polynomial, so we've got n equals 4. And what is a n? Remember, First one was a n here, and then a3 goes with the x cubed, and then a2 would go with x squared, but where is that? So first, a n is 2, which is also the exact same thing as a4, because a4, we've got n as 4, so a4 equals 2. What is a3? Well, a3, what is the coefficient for x cubed? That is 8. What is the coefficient for the x squared? So we look at this and we realize, oh, that didn't show up at all. But we could rewrite this as 2x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 0x squared because x squared never showed up, so it must have been knocked out by something. It's been knocked out by this 0 plus 2 to the fifth x minus 19. So if that's the case, then it must be that it's a2 equals 0. The plugging in for a2, it must be 0 because it has to be able to knock out that x squared term. Then from there, we just continue. a1 is equal to 2 to the fifth. And finally, our last one is a0 at the very end. a0 equals negative 19. So now we see what all the coefficients are. We know what the degree is. Great. Second example, expand and simplify this expression. So we've got x minus 2 squared times quantity x cubed minus x plus 3. First thing we have to do is we have to realize that x minus 2 squared is just the same thing as x minus 2 times x minus 2, right? If I have smiley face squared, then that's the same thing as smiley face times smiley face, right? So if I've got x minus 2 squared, then that's just x minus 2 times x minus 2. Then x cubed minus x plus 3. Let's start on the left and work our way to the right. x minus 2 times x minus 2. Well, that'll get us x squared, x times x, minus 2 times x, minus 2 times x, minus 2 times negative 2 becomes plus 4. And then x cubed minus x plus 3. Haven't really worked with that yet. Let's simplify the left side first. x minus 2x minus 2x plus 4. We Oh, whoops, sorry, not x times x. x times x becomes x squared. Sorry about that. So we've got x squared minus 2x minus 2x plus 4. x squared minus 2x minus 2x. That becomes x squared minus 4x, as we combine like terms, plus 4. Then times quantity x cubed minus x plus 3. All right, let's use different colors for the various pieces we have here. So x squared times x cubed. x squared times x cubed becomes x to the fifth x squared times negative x becomes minus x cubed. x squared times positive 3 becomes plus 3x squared. Next color for negative 4x, so that was our x squared portion. Negative 4x we'll do in blue, so negative 4x times x cubed will become minus 4x to the fourth. Negative 4x times negative x becomes positive 4x squared. And then negative 4x times positive 3 becomes minus 12x. Final one we'll do in green. Plus 4, 4 times x cubed becomes plus 4x cubed. 4 times negative x becomes minus 4x. 4 times 3 becomes plus 12. Great. Now we have to simplify this. Now, 
This isn't too difficult to simplify, but it's easy to get lost, right? Each of the steps that we're about to do is pretty darn easy. The hard part is making sure we don't accidentally have any tiny missteps as we work through this. So I'd recommend checking and doing them by exponent. So first thing we'll do is we'll look at all the x to the fifths. We see that there are no other x to the fifths, so we just bring it down. We've got x to the fifth, and then we'll cross this out so we don't accidentally see it again, don't accidentally wind up trying to use it again. Next up, we've got x to the fourths. Where are x to the fourths? We've got minus 4x to the fourth. Do we have any other x to the fourths? We look through it. No, we don't have any other minus, uh, sorry, any other x to the fourth. So we've got, bring that down, minus 4x to the fourth, and then we cross it out so we don't actually try to use it again. Next, let's look for our x cubed. We've got an x cubed right here. Anywhere else? Yes, we do. We've got another x cubed here. So we bring those together. Minus x cubed plus 4x cubed becomes plus 3x cubed, right? negative 1 plus 4, so we get plus 3x cubed, and then we cross those out. Next up, 3x squared and 4x squared, no other x squareds. 3x squared plus 4x squared becomes 7x squared. We cross those out. Next up, our x's, minus 12x, minus 4x. Combine those together, we get minus 16x. Knock those out, and plus 12. And there we are. Now, you don't have to do this method of saying, here's my x to the fifths, here's my x to the fourths, and so on and so on, and then crossing them out as you go. But this is a great way to make sure you don't accidentally make a mistake. It's easy when you're working with this many terms and trying to put them together and simplify. It's easy to make one tiny mistake and lose the entire problem because of it. So it's a good idea to have some method of being able to follow your work and make sure you don't accidentally try to do the same thing twice or completely miss a term. All right, next one. Give an example of a quadratic trinomial, a cubic monomial, and a linear binomial. So quadratic trinomial, remember, quadratic meant degree 2, and then trinomial meant three terms. Cubic monomial is a degree 3. Cubic means degree 3. Monomial, mono, single, like monorail, a train track with one rail. Not really a train anymore, but... Monomial is one term. And then finally, linear, degree one. And binomial, two terms, by Bi like bicycle. Great. So if we want to give an example of this, we just need something that's degree two. So degree two, three terms. If it's degree two and it has three terms, then we're going to have something that has x squared at the front and it has to have blank spots for a total of three things. Now we can't have zero show up in these because then it would disappear and we wouldn't have a term there. So we'll have to put in something. So let's put in, you know, let's call it 5x squared plus 3x and we'll make it negative 17. You could plug anything into these blanks and the answer would still be correct. So 5x squared plus 3x minus 17. There's our quadratic trinomial. Next up, we do a cubic monomial. So we know it has to be degree 3. So degree 3 means it has to be x cubed, and it's only one term. So there's going to be a blank in front of the x cubed, but we're not allowed to have any other blank stuff. Because if we did, then we'd have more than one term, right? We're only allowed to have one term. So all of that gets knocked right out. It disappears. And we've got just blank x cubed. We plug whatever we feel like in. I feel like negative 47. So we get negative 47 x cubed. Great. Final one, we have a linear binomial. Linear binomial. Binomial has to have two terms. Linear is degree one, so we've got x to the one, with some blank in front of it, plus blank. Blank x plus blank. What goes in those blanks? Whatever we feel like. We're not allowed to have any other blanks, though, because then we have more than two terms. Also, we can't have any more blanks because we're linear, and that's the most that we could have there. So blank x plus blank. Let's put in uh, one for the x and negative seven for the constant, so we've got x minus 7. Great. Last thing, explain why it's impossible to have a linear trinomial. So if we're going to have a linear trinomial, let's see what is that structure got to be. Well, if we're linear, we know that it's going to be x is going to be at the front. And so if we do the normal structure that we have for polynomials, it'll be blank x plus blank. But if it's a trinomial, Trinomial means we have to have three terms. So if we try to force on a third term, we'd have to have blank x squared, right? We've already got blank x plus blank, so the only way to go is to go to the 
left, right? We have to have higher and higher exponents. So blank x squared, well, blank x squared, all of a sudden, we are now we're a trinomial, but we're not linear anymore. So it means that we can't have both of these things at the same time, right? We can't both be linear and have a third term. Otherwise, we'd have to have x squared, at which point we wouldn't be linear anymore. We'd be quadratic. So it's going to be one or the other. You can't both be trinomial and a linear function. Great. Final example, what is the degree of y equals negative 2x squared plus 4, all that, to the 407? Now, you see this at first, and you might freak out because you're like, I can't possibly expand 407 times. I can't do that. But don't worry. All they asked for was the degree, right? So notice, if I've got quantity x squared plus 3 times quantity x to the fifth plus 48, do I have to look at anything else to figure out what the degree is going to be other than the front parts? No, because I know only the x squared and the x fifth are going to come together to make x to the seventh. And there's going to be other stuff, but I know I can't get any higher exponents out of this than the x to the seventh. It's going to be the leading term that will have the highest exponent. It's going to be the exact same thing on this one. It's going to be that negative 2x squared. It's a question of how many times does negative 2x squared hit negative 2x squared, right? That's the only thing that's going to be able to really bring increases to the degree. There's going to be a whole bunch of other stuff, but we're not concerned with it because all they asked for was the degree. So it's going to be negative 2x squared raised to the 407 plus other stuff. But we don't care about the other stuff. So negative 2x squared plus 407, well, we distribute that negative 2 to the 407, x squared to the 407. So if we've got 407 x squared, then it's x squared times x squared times x squared times x squared. So it's going to be the same thing as x to the 2 times 407, because they're going to iterate that many times. It's going to hit that many times. So we've got negative 2, 407 times x to the 2 times 407. So negative 2 to the 407 times x814, x to the 814. So our degree is n equals 814. That is our degree for this polynomial. Now, as x goes very far to the left, x goes to negative infinity. Will y go up or down? y approaches positive infinity or y approaches negative infinity? And then what about as x goes very far to the right, as x goes to positive infinity? So to do that, we need the leading coefficient test, right? So leading coefficient test. So at this point, we already know what the degree of this polynomial is, right? This polynomial is n equals 814, so it is an even degree polynomial. Now we want to figure out what is our leading coefficient. Is it positive or negative? So plus or minus. We do that negative 2 to the 407 times x to the 814. Well, if it's negative raised to an even number, they'll all get canceled out. If it's negative raised to an odd number, one of them remains because it will wind up getting to stick around. It will all of the even part will get canceled out, but that odd is an extra plus one, so it sticks around. So we'll get negative 2 to the 407 times x to the 814. That means we've got a negative sign right here. So by the leading coefficient test, we've got negative and even. So negative and even means an even one even normally goes in the same way that a parabola goes, cups up normally. So even at positive, but even at negative, will flip that cupping shape and we'll get that. Now, of course, we don't actually know what's in the middle. All we know is the extremes, because that's all we were guaranteed from the leading coefficient test. But that's all we have to figure out, because it's as x approaches negative infinity. So from this, we see even as it goes negative, we go down on the left, down on the right. So as x approaches the negative infinity, as x goes very far to the left, we're going to approach y going to negative infinity. As x goes very far to the right, x goes to infinity, we're going to get x go y going to negative infinity once again. All right, great. Leading coefficient test to be able to figure that out. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Next time we'll look at roots and zeros of polynomials and get a really good understanding of how these things are working. All right, bye.